welcome. Today we meet a man who's born in Hyderabad, India and moved to the UK as a student. From a one-bedroom flat, he started his Cobra Beer business and turned it into a multi-million dollar business. Entrepreneur and life peer, Lord Karen Billamoria. Karen Billamoria was born in Hyderabad to a decorated military family. But rather than follow the family tradition and join the Indian Army, he became an entrepreneur and started his own multi-million dollar business. In his teens, he came to the UK to study, and while at Cambridge University, he developed an idea to create an Indian beer. From a London flat, he turned that idea into Cobra beer, brewed in India and imported to the world. Billamoria has received numerous awards and honorary degrees and was appointed a commander in the British Empire for services to business and entrepreneurship. In 2016, he became an independent peer in the House of Lords. He's passionate about reforming the immigration policy to get the brightest to Britain. He is also the founding member of India's Global Advisory Council. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm going to take you back to your student days. Can you tell me a bit about the journey from going to India to the UK? I was brought up in India, went to seven different schools. My father was in the Indian Army, so we moved around a lot. I've been to school in Hyderabad, in Kerala, in Delhi, in Uti. And uh, in fact, my first degree was at Osmania University in Hyderabad, where I graduated at the age of 19 and very proud that this year Osmania University is celebrating its centenary. I then came to the UK at the age of 19 for my further and higher education. How was that like, the going from India to the UK? For me it was something that was inevitable because I was uh, the third generation in my family to be educated in the UK on both sides. Both my grandparents were educated in the UK, my mother went to university in the UK and uh, I'm the third generation. Now my son, our eldest, is at university in the UK, so fourth generation. Was it, it was the 1980s, was it a difficult, what was Britain like at that time? The Britain that I came to in the early 1980s was a very different Britain to today. Uh, it was uh, um, known as a sick man of Europe. It had no respect in the world economy. It was a country where there was still a glass ceiling. In fact, my family and friends in India said to me, if you decide to work after your studies in Britain, remember you'll never get to the top, you won't be allowed to get to the top because as a foreigner there will be a glass ceiling. And I'm sorry to say they were right three decades ago. Today they would be wrong um, and that glass ceiling has now been shattered and uh, Britain, a country which was uh, in a bad way economically, which was not respected as an economy, um, I've seen entrepreneurship flourish over these decades, I've seen Britain as an economy open up and Britain is now one of the five, six largest economies in the world and um, has been the envy of Europe. You started Cobra Beer. Um, at where was the inspiration and what made you want to start it? I qualified as a chartered accountant with what is today EY, Ernst & Young, in London. I did a law degree at the University of Cambridge and it was while I was at Cambridge that I came up with the idea for Cobra Beer, for a beer that was different a uh, beer that would have the refreshment of a lager and the smoothness of an ale combined and would have a globally appealing taste and would go well with Indian food and with all food. And our slogan today is brewed smooth for all food. And we launched it within the Indian restaurants initially and uh, today we are 98.6% of all the 7,000 licensed Indian restaurants in the UK and in all the supermarkets, uh, Tesco's and Waitrose, Asda, Walmart, Sainsbury's um, and we export to four, 40 countries around the world. We manufacture in the UK, we manufacture in Europe and we also with Molson Coors have a partnership of three breweries in India. You were warned by family members as you said not not to start a business here, not to work here but um, but you did and you flourished. How were you treated though as an Indian businessman? If I had started my business in the early 80s maybe I would have faced some prejudice. But by the time I started my business in 1989, it was in the cusp of India's liberalization. And I knew India would liberalize, and sure enough, in 1991, India liberalized. Uh, but it was also, when I started my business, was after Britain had opened up. Um, Big Bang had taken place in the city. The city of London was emerging as a global financial market, and today is the number one financial market in the world. 
entrepreneurship was being encouraged by Margaret Thatcher. People like Richard Branson were being celebrated. Uh, and so there was a move, and I caught the wave at the right time in the rising tide of entrepreneurship in Britain. Uh, and Britain is a country opening up. Uh, and so my timing was good in that sense. My timing was bad because when I started Cobra in 1990, we were in the midst of a terrible recession. Uh, interest rates went up to 15%. It's very difficult to raise finance. But on the other hand, Indian food was getting more and more popular, and entrepreneurship was getting more and more popular. And India was liberalizing as well. So the timing in that sense was good. And uh, I faced nothing but encouragement uh, during my entrepreneurial journey. Of course, raising finance for growing business is a challenge. When I had no money, I had 20,000 pounds of student debt to pay off. Um, I had no security to provide. I just had the belief in my brand. Uh, you mentioned uh, a bit earlier that your father was uh, a celebrated military general. Um, were you ever tempted to go down the military route? Yes, I, I was. I remember when I was leaving school, I had to make that decision. Do I go into the army like my father, my grandfather? My great-grandfather was in the police. My mother's father served in the Royal Indian Air Force. Uh, so I had very much services in my, my, my family background and I decided to go for a business career as opposed to services. And my father never forced me, to his credit, but I had the advantage of having been brought up in the army as a child from childhood, and my father was commissioned into the Gurkhas and commanded the Gurkhas in the liberation of Bangladesh. Uh, so I benefited from having been brought up in the army, although I uh, didn't actually serve myself. So to this day in the House of Lords, I speak in defense debates, because, and I've always engaged with the British Army throughout my time in the UK, uh, in, including Army charities. And now I'm a Deputy Lieutenant since 2001, where I represent the Queen, and I've been in uniform. So my father, before he passed away, saw me in uniform and gave me his sword, which had been given to him by his grandfather, which I wear with pride today. What lessons did you learn growing up in that, that military tradition? Growing up in the army background was a huge advantage for me. Uh, one, I was fortunate that my father's battalion had won two Victoria Crosses in the Second World War, and two, three Victoria Crosses in the Second World War, and two of them were alive, one was posthumous. And I was brought up with these two Victoria Cross holders from childhood. So to be brought up with living legends uh, was a privilege. To be inspired by them, to know them personally, was just wonderful. And then also, to be my father's son and to watch my father progress through the army eventually becoming a general commanding the Central Indian Army with 350,000 troops, to see leadership in action at close quarters and learn from your own father, that was priceless and I have always benefited from that and always will benefit from that. Why did you get into politics? I was always very keen um, and interested in politics. Uh, when I was at Cambridge University, I took an active part in the union. I was vice president of the union. I led the Cambridge Union debating team two years running against Oxford University Union. And um, my opponent is, has been a senior cabinet minister. And uh, a lot of today's uh, MPs, ministers, cabinet ministers are contemporaries of mine from my Cambridge days. So um, I was very active in politics. and. It one stage I knew I would get involved and the choice was becoming a member of parliament in the House of Commons which would have meant giving up my business um, or somehow getting involved later and then fortunately I had the opportunity to join the House of Lords as a, an independent crossbench peer which I joined in 2006 and that has enabled me to participate in politics but also to continue running and building my business. Um, you've been vocally opposed to Brexit, um, are you, what's your thoughts about it now? I think Brexit is a huge mistake. Uh, I, I really believe we should never have had a referendum. We should have never voted to leave the European Union uh, for many reasons. And the main reasons why people chose to leave the European Union, they were numerous, but the main three reasons were one, the money that we contribute to the European Union, the eight and a half billion pounds net that we contribute to being members of the European Union. Nobody puts this into context. That eight and a half billion pounds makes up just one percent of our annual government expenditure per year. It wouldn't even shift the dial. On a pie chart, it would be a thin line that you'd have to point an arrow to show 
that is the proportion of our annual government expenditure. I would pay that eight billion pounds just for the peace that we've had in the European Union for over seven decades, let alone all the other benefits that we get from being members of the European Union. The next reason people voted to leave the European Union was the fear of immigration, fueled by parties like UKIP, which has now shown itself to be a completely defunct, useless party that nobody should ever have taken seriously. But 14% of the public did fall for them and did vote for them in the referendum. And now UKIP is barely polling 2 or 3% in the general election because people have seen the light. But the anti-immigration rhetoric that emanated from UKIP, and sadly, that a lot of the Conservative Party's attitudes towards immigration is negative. The attitude immigration from the European Union, the 3.2 million people from the European Union who actually live and work in the UK have contributed hugely to our economy. In fact, without them, we would have a labour shortage. What, again, people do not realise is that we have less than 5% unemployment in this country, one of the lowest levels in our history. And we have the highest level of employment that we've had in our country. So what would we have done without the 3.2 million people? And then the perception is given that they are just low-skilled labour. Well, actually, the people who come from the European Union work at every level, at low skills in terms of agricultural workers. They also work in the hospitality industry, the construction industry, 250,000 people, our public services. The people who said they're a burden on the public services many of our public services would not function without them. The National Health Service has over 130,000 people from the European Union working in the care and health sector. And then, you look at the City of London, the number one financial centre in the world, without the input from the European Union at the highest level of skills, let alone in universities, where 30% of our academics at our top universities, Russell Group universities like the University of Birmingham or Oxford, Cambridge, are foreign, and of that, well over half are from the European Union. And our international students, of which 450,000 are from all over the world, and I'm proud to be the president of the UK Council for International Students Affairs, of those 450,000 students, almost 200,000 of them are from the European Union. So they benefit our economy in every way. And the third reason why people voted to leave was this whole aspect of control over our own laws and our own sovereignty. Well, when you ask people, name one European Union law that affects you on a day-to-day -day basis. When you ask people to name one European law that affects them on a day-to-day -day basis, most people cannot even name one. In fact, the European Court of Justice, Britain, has won more cases than they've lost in the European Court of Justice that benefited our economy. And the reality is that having built a business for over a quarter of a century, I've never wasted one hour of one day worrying about European Union law. And then when it comes to our sovereignty, people don't realize we've had the best of both worlds. We've been at the top table of Europe, but yet we're not in the euro. The euro is a disaster as a currency. Thank God we're not in it, we're not in it. Schengen, I thought the UK used to lose out from business and tourist visitors. Today, thanks to not being in Schengen, we're in a stronger position with regard to the migration crisis and from a security point of view. And we drive our cars on the left-hand side of the road, not on the right-hand side of the road. I pour Cobra Bay in pints when I want to, and I also pour it in litres, seven litres in supermarket shelves. So no one can tell us what we want to do if we don't want to do it. We've got full control of our sovereignty. In fact, I put it this way, we have the best of both worlds. So whichever way you look at it, Brexit is completely unnecessary, and we're far worse off as a result of it. And I hope it doesn't happen. Because, again, what most people don't realize is Article 50 is revocable by us. At any time from now until the end of March 2019, we as a country can decide we want to stay in the European Union unilaterally, withdraw Article 50, and we carry on as normal. Do you think it will be stopped? I think when people, and it has to come from the people, when the people around the UK understand and appreciate the full situation in the way that I've just outlined, I don't think anyone will want to leave the European Union. It would be better to stay within the European Union. You mentioned international students, and you're quite passionate about the need to welcome and have international students. Why is that? International students uh, are a huge benefit to Britain for a number of reasons. Firstly, economically, they contribute £25 billion pounds to the economy every year. This is a figure from Universities UK, the Association of Uni universities in the United Kingdom. 25 billion pounds, that's a huge figure. Next, they contribute 
to the experience of our domestic students and the friends that our domestic students make, the cultures that they learn from, from international students from around the world is phenomenal. Lifelong generation, long friendships are formed. My mother to this day keeps in touch with her university friends from the University of Birmingham from the 1950s. She will visit them whenever she comes to the UK. They're in regular touch, they speak to each other. There are 30 world leaders at any one time who've been educated at British universities. It is one of our strongest elements of soft power that exists. So every way that you look at it, international students benefit our universities, our students, and our economy, and the local economies in which they live as well. And then that also leads to academics. Mm -hmm. Some of them stay on and do research and become academics. Those academics are some of the finest academics in the world today. The head of the Royal Society, as a scientist, one of the best things you can ever achieve is becoming president of the Royal Society. Well, the president of the Royal Society today is Venki Ramakrishnan from India, Nobel laureate, Trinity College, Cambridge. Now, how wonderful that that is what foreign students and where they can actually get to and contribute to our economy and our country. Currently, isn't the government thinking of closing down those numbers? The go government's attitude to immigration has been absolutely wrong. The Prime Minister's attitude to it when she was Home Secretary and sadly which has continued is a perception that is created of anti-immigration. Um, when the Prime Minister's visit took place in November, it was a perfect opportunity for the Prime Minister to announce in India saying, well with China we have now reduced the multiple entry visa for business and tourist visitors for a two-year visa to £85. For India it's well over £300. We had the chance to give Indian visitors the same rate. It didn't happen. We continue to include international students within our net migration figures. And the government keeps reiterating, and it's now a manifesto pledge of the Conservative Party, to reduce net migration to 100,000. Now, if you include international students with net migration figures, the perception that sends out is that you want to reduce international students to get down to below 100,000. All our competitor countries, the United States of America, Canada, Australia, exclude international students and do not treat them as immigrants when they calculate their net migration figures. Why do we have to do it? In Parliament, because the Prime Minister wasn't listening, the Home Office wasn't listening, the government wasn't listening, we took it to legislation. We had a vote in the House of Lords, we defeated the government by over a hundred, almost a hundred. The House of Commons didn't accept it and in the rush to get the bill through before the elections, the government once again has not accepted that they should exclude international students when calculation net migration figures. So this is the mistake the government is making, sending out the wrong perceptions to the world and the beneficiaries of that are our competitor countries. So more students are going to Australia, more students are going to Canada and of course the United States and in fact we're competing with our European countries now where you have non-English speaking countries that are trying to attract students from India including France, Holland, Germany, Sweden. And our universities, British universities, are the best in the world along with the United States of America. We should be sending out a signal saying we welcome international students. We want more from countries like India. And we, we would relish having you here. We want you here. We encourage you to come here. Not send out the opposite result, uh, the, exactly the opposite message and perception. Um, when I spoke to you last, there was, you noticed, you personally had a Brexit backlash. There were, you experienced racism. Can you tell me a bit about that and how the situation might, might be now? What this, this anti-immigration rhetoric uh, that has been coming out from UKIP, that has been coming out from the government, uh, has led to, I feel, a rolling back of the wonderful progress this country has made from being a country with prejudice, a country which was looked upon as a closed old boys network, a closed shop. You couldn't get to the top unless you'd been to the right school or the right university. Today that glass ceiling has been shattered. We have Britain as a truly aspirational country, regardless of race, religion or background. And last year, from the time of Brexit, for the first time, I personally experienced, experienced racism, which I'd never experienced in all these years. And I saw this wonderful progress this country had made into being a genuine multicultural, outward looking, a country that celebrates diversity, not tolerates it, to actually going backwards 
and we've got to stop that. And, and Brexit was the catalyst for that. And that is really bad for Britain uh, and bad for our country in every way. You, you said um, you received letters, you, you received hate. Was that, do you think it was a blip? Has, has it continued? Are you s continuing to get anti-immigration uh, anti rhetoric? Uh, what I received at the time were tweets, emails, letters, the lot, um, which I'd never received before. Uh, what has happened since is now there's been a, uh, an attitude in the country that, oh well, we voted for Brexit, by the way, only 52-48, and people being misled in a big way, uh, now let's just get on with it and implement it. Uh, and, and there are people like me who are saying, no, Brexit was, yes, we want to leave the European Union, but on what basis? Nobody has agreed to exactly what basis. And the Prime Minister talks about no deal is better than a bad deal. Well, I'm sorry, no deal is a bad deal. In fact, no deal is the worst possible deal that we can have. Uh, and I don't think that's acceptable, leaving the single market, which is 45% of our exports and 55% of our imports, 50% of our trade, is bad for British business and bad for the British economy. We can't just leave it um, without people really, a lot of people who voted to leave didn't realize that, that would mean leaving the single market. So let alone losing our influence, let alone the jeopardy to peace. And uh, so I, I think that all that awakening of the reality is going to happen over the next two years. Brexit, uh, you know, had that anti-immigration feeling and uh, unfortunately Britain has gone through a very bad time these last three months with um, three terror attacks, Westminster Bridge, Manchester bombing of course, the recent attacks in London. Why do you think, first of all, Britain is a target? I think this feeling of immigration um, within Britain is, on the whole, I think that Britain is a wonderfully welcoming and open country and society. And the fact that these 3.2 million people from the European Union who live and work here, in Parliament, in the House of Lords, we had a vote, one of the biggest votes in the history of the House of Lords. One vote was 614, another vote was 634, the biggest ever vote in the history of the House of Lords um, in recent memory. We voted to give the 3.2 million people from the European Union who live and work here the unilateral right to remain here because on the whole we appreciate what these people have done and contributed to our economy to our society and to this country so on the whole i think the feeling is a very good feeling but sadly what has happened is in encouraging multiculturalism in this country has been on the one hand excellent on the other hand i do believe we need to also more and more encourage integration one where you need to have people who are coming to britain integrating with the whole of British society. Mm -hmm. And what has happened, I feel, is that there are elements in, in Britain who unfortunately um, have been radicalized. Uh, and the terrorism that is happening is now happening on a global scale. We are told there are over 20,000 people who are of a radical mindset and ideology who wish harm to Britain. And, uh, and I think that that is a very, very dangerous situation and we need to deal with that. And I've been saying for years we need to be encouraging integration in this country. Multiculturalism on its own is very good, but multiculturalism without integration, then you can get people who, are, who feel they're not connected with Britain and then you have this extreme situation that we have over here uh, with these small minority. I mean, we're talking about a country of 65 million people but it's a small minority of people um, who can cause so much harm and through their awful um, behavior, tragic, awful, barbaric um, acts uh, that nobody would, would ever um, accept as being British or I it's very sad. You think integration is, is essential to, to stop terrorism, but how do you suggest integration takes place? Integration has to be something that is encouraged in a very proactive manner. And it's got to be something that you work with communities, with minority communities, and with immigrant communities to integrate. And there's a fine line between integration and assimilation. Because what one wants to do is to have people having the freedom in Britain to practice whatever religion they want to, 
to speak there and, and, and retain their, their, their heritage, their history, their culture, but yet also integrate into the British way of life, learn English for a start, but also respect the English British way of life as well. And then you have this mutual respect and a celebration of the cultures and the diversity. And it's not tolerance, it's a celebration of each other's diversity and cultures. That is what um, the integration is all about. Uh, and, 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 and that is not happening everywhere. And, and then you can get people who are, are isolated from the mainstream society, get radicalized into this warped ideology of a religion that no one would accept that that is what the religion is about at all. Um, every religion basically promotes goodness, righteousness, compassion, and love, not killing and hatred. No religion practices that. So these are people with a warped ideology. Um, and I do, I do believe integration is one of the best ways where you can prevent that. COBRA has charitable foundation, um, provides support in South Asia. Why was it important to you to give back to South Asia? Again, I think that um, it's very important never to forget your roots. It's like my father, when I went to study in, in, in Britain for the first time, he said, look, you're going abroad, you're going to Britain, you may go and live and work in another part of the world. Wherever you are in the world, integrate into that community and country as best as you can, but never forget your roots. And that's why I think it's very important to celebrate people's roots and cultures. And for Cobra Beer, our base uh, are the Indian restaurants, the curry restaurants. And it is, the brand is originally Indian as well. And so we, it's very important for us to retain that link with India. Um, and India, yes, on the one hand, is the fastest growing major economy in the world. It is a country that has a space program, is a country that has high-end manufacturing. Um, it has just launched more satellites in one go than anywhere else in the world. It's got phenomenal capabilities, but India also has huge challenges with over 1.2 billion people. Uh, India, arguably today, is the largest populated country in the world, but also has hundreds of millions of people still living on less than a dollar a day that we can try and help. As India progresses, we can help India as much as we can. And I think the Cobra Foundation, through the work we're doing, for example, with WaterAid, where we sell Cobra Foundation Baloo water to um, hundreds of Indian restaurants in the country. And we give 100% of the profit we make from that water, 100% of it, to WaterAid for water projects for clean water and sanitation in South Asia. And we're proud of that. You mentioned uh, India is growing exponentially, um, and Prime Minister Modi has been in power now for around three years, just past the three-year mark. What do you ma have you met him? Yes. And what do you make of him as a leader? Well, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is one of the most um, inspirational leaders um, on the world stage at the moment. Uh, he is, in my view, the best orator when he speaks in Hindi that I've ever come across his ability to engage an audience, whether it's round a table which I've been with him, whether it's one-to-one -one which I've been with him, or whether it's at Wembley Stadium with 60,000 people where I've been present, he can connect with an audience in a way that I've seen no one else can. Uh, he's a brilliant communicator. He's got a clear vision for where he wants to get to with India. He has the ability to articulate that vision in a way that can connect with his catchy Make in India Tech India, Smart India, Smart Cities. He's got uh, the ability to communicate it with these initiatives. And of course, the challenge is with the country of India scale and with a federal system of states, where states operate as countries, to deliver those initiatives is always going to be a challenge. And um, I know he is doing his best as Prime Minister to deliver these initiatives throughout the country. And what he's also doing is not only uh, building a pride in India within India, but he's also traveled abroad more than I think any other prime minister, probably on the global stage today, where he's, from the time he's been prime minister, traveled around the world, promoting India and engaging also with the Indian diaspora. They're now approaching 30 million of us around the world, and the Indian diaspora now is just going from strength to strength, whether it's here in Britain, where we have cabinet ministers, where the wealthiest family in, in Britain are Indian, and now the Irish 
new Irish Prime Minister is of Indian origin as well. And I always say we'll here in the UK have a Prime Minister of Indian origin within my lifetime. So the Indian community is going from strength to strength, which is something India can truly harness, be proud of and benefit from and engage them more and more, which the Prime Minister is doing. Prime Minister Modi ha engages ha his population he's, and he's, he's well liked and he's doing well in India. And um, in America, uh, we have now the new, fairly new President Trump. And he has a very different kind of style and message. Uh, first of all, what do, you, what do you make of him as a leader? Well, when we talk about populist leaders and this rise of populism, and President Trump is held up as an example of that, what I think one has to understand is this difference between having faith in leadership and also being dissatisfied with the status quo and an anti-establishment. Uh, where Prime Minister Narendra Modi, for example, is a very popular leader, but he's also somebody that who's, who's been a uh, chief minister for a st of a state for over a decade, who's had a lot of experience in running a state with a population larger than, larger than the United Kingdom, and then becoming leader of a country and a national party. Um, and he's got a very clear vision and he's popular. The populism that is represented by Donald Trump is very different. That's an anti-establishment um, somebody who's come in through that route um, and it, it's a populism which has right-wing elements to it that are perceived as being anti-immigration. Um, now we've had this whole issue with climate change which has taken the whole world by surprise. It's very different and fortunately in Europe there was a danger we were going to go down that route and in Austria it nearly happened. It didn't. In Holland it nearly happened. It didn't. In France it nearly happened. It didn't. Thank God it didn't. So now with Macron in France, and now let's see what happens in Germany. Hopefully by this autumn, Germany will have stable leadership of a sensible variety. The UK will then be feeling that we're the outsider. And I think that again, from being at the top table of the world, United uh, Nations Security Council permanent seat, G7, G8, G20, and the top table of Europe, by not being in Europe, we're going to lose our influence in a big way. I think it's important that although Britain is no longer a superpower, Britain is still very much a global power and retaining our global influence is very, very important for Britain. And by leaving the European Union, we will be losing influence. And I don't want to lose our influence on the world stage and being at the top table of the world and being one of the fifth, sixth largest economies in the world. From what I gather, you're not a fan of the populist, populist right-wing movement. What is the antidote to it? The best antidote to any form of extre extremism, whether it's extreme left, which I'm not a fan of, um, which has proven not to work anywhere in the world, the Marxist communist model is a failed model, and the extreme right, which historically has shown how dangerous that is, and we've seen that over the decades around the world, um, when you come to extreme dictatorships, for example. The best ground is a center ground that is sensible, and through good governance, where you have a balance between the freedoms, the liberty, the justice that, e that exist in a country like the United Kingdom, but balanced by an encouragement of entrepreneurship, an encouragement of business, an encouragement of your economy, and yet having people well educated, investing in education at the school level. Britain, for example, 7% of our children go to private schools. They are the best schools in the world. Yet 93% don't get the opportunity to go to those schools, the grammar schools of which now there are only 160, just over 160. The state school system in Britain needs a lot more investment to improve. Our universities, the best in the world, but we invest. Our universities are the best in the world, but we invest far less a proportion of GDP than a country like America. Just imagine if we invested more, how good they could be. For a country to improve its productivity, you need to invest in research and development. We invest 1.7% of our GDP in research and development. A country like America or Germany invests 28 to 3% of their GDP every year in research and development innovation. To do that, Britain would need to spend an extra 20 billion pounds a year on R&D innovation. Just imagine how much more productive, 
how much better our universities would be, our businesses would be, our skills would be if we invested in R&D and innovation. So that's what you need in a country. And then you need a country that has the wealth and the ability to look after the people who need the help. A welfare state that is fair, a welfare state that has that safety net to help people who need that safety net. Uh, and, and in Britain we have an amazing welfare state. Um, we're a very wealthy country and you need that combination of a welfare state but a national health service, for example, that with £123 billion of investment is not working to people's satisfaction at the moment. And then as a percentage of GDP, we could invest more in health, but it's also how that investment is put to work. And our nurses in this country work so hard, but ca get, don't get paid anywhere near as much as they, they need, I believe they deserve to be paid. So you've got a health service that we're providing, but that could be so much more effective. So then you get a country where you don't have extremism, you don't have extreme left or extreme right, but a country that delivers for all, but in a competitive way. You mentioned um, the climate change decision that President Trump made was a shock. Do you think it was the wrong decision? Without a doubt. The, the decision President Trump made was absolutely wrong. When you've got the whole world united on this, um, that's a country like America is seen a, as a leader in the world. And within America, this complete disarray and disagreement with what he has done. Uh, and, and I think that um, it is wrong. And I'm sure America will U-turn on that in due course. When it comes to uh, a president who seems to have lots of controversial views, do you think it's a danger for not just America, but it's a danger for world policy. It's, it is very destabilizing for the global community when you have the world's main superpower uh, in every way, whether it's in defense, or whether it's in defense capability, or whether it's in economic capabilities. Um, the, the United States of America is the world's superpower. And, and, and from a security point of view, at one stage the commitment to NATO was being questioned, but thank God President Trump is remaining committed to NATO. And the basic principle of NATO that if one country of NATO is attacked, then everyone will defend that country. Um, at one stage was looking as if that was in jeopardy. Now that would destabilize the world in a big way. Uh, fortunately that is still there and I think security is the most important thing. And again here in the UK, our ability to deal with this terrorism, which sadly is, is here. Um, we don't know when the next incident will happen. And they say lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. Well, sadly, Westminster Bridge and the attack on Parliament happened in March. And less than three months later, we've had an attack on London Bridge and Borough Market in almost the same way. Lightning has struck twice. We've got to be able to deal with this terrorism. To deal with terrorism, apart from working on dealing with the ideology challenge, you also have to have the ability to deal with it with the resources. And I think it's been negligent of our country in the UK to cut back on our police forces in the way that we have. In fact, since 9-11, since the sad attacks that took place in 7-7 over a decade ago in this country, we should have been more than doubling up our resources of anti-terrorism, of our investigative abilities, of our police force on the ground, and our armed forces. And instead, we've cut back on our police force and we've cut back on our armed forces. Sadly, the British Army cannot even fill Wembley Stadium today. That is, in my view, negligent. And I think we need now need to invest much more in our police forces to see a British policeman on the streets is a reassurance to the public and it's a deterrent to anyone. We need to build back our police force. And finally for you, whether it's international students, climate change, terrorism, what do you believe is the most pressing issue the world is facing? By far, the biggest responsibility of any government is the security of its people. And the security of its people comes about by having the resources to do that. And also, it's no longer just a national issue. Um, it is a global issue. So the more that we in Britain 
are not only integrated into the world global community which we are, but the more we're at the top table of the world, which we have been, that is very important in maintaining our security um, of our citizens, both internally and externally. And I think that is the number one priority um, of our country. Yes, you need economic progress and the more economically um, powerful you are as a country, the better off your citizens are, the wealthier you are, the more you can do good within your country. And it's a combination of that. It's a combination of our economic success, of our skills, of our education, of our ability to look after people and providing that, that, that safety net. But none of that um, can happen without everyone feeling absolutely secure. And that's the number one priority of a government. Lord Karen Bill Moria, thank you. Thank you.